This is the Throstle Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing. Well, hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Throstle Club. It's the programme which looks back on the long and illustrious history of West Bromwich Albion. And we speak to former players and supporters about their memories of our marvellous club, with a particular emphasis on this month in history. Now, sitting alongside me as usual is the man whose form rate is always excellent, the former sports Argus man, Bob Downing. Hello, Norman. How are you? Yeah, grand. Good to see you again, Bob. And sitting up as it... As always, he's Black Country Radio's very own Billy Spakeman. He'll be chipping in with his own comments. And you've guessed it. You are, aren't you? You're still twiddling your knobs in the corner. I've got my knobs here. Right exactly. Yeah. He claims he's doing it just to keep us on air. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. And our special studio guest today is an Albion fan and a Stato, Steve Carr, who's making a welcome return to the Throstle Club. Morning, Norm. Morning, everybody. So good to see you again. Now, Steve, you'll be talking about Albion's early grounds and a brilliant new book that's just been published, which you just happened to uh, to have written. Uh, I've, I've co-written it, yeah. There's, there's, there's actually five of us. It's, um, it's a real group effort, but yeah, yeah. We'll find out a little bit about that then. It's all about Albion's her- early history going right back to 1878. So uh, you might be mentioned in that, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so there's certainly loads to talk about in this edition of the Throstle Club. Fabulous Hawthorne's choir there with the Lord's My Shepherd bringing us into this July 2024 edition of the Throstle Club. So, Bob, let's look back at some of the things that have happened in Albion's history over the years. We won't go back too far to start with. Good. We go back <laughs> just th- 35 years. Yeah. Which are July 1989. And the sad death of uh, Laurie Cunningham occurred in July 1989. It was in a car crash uh, near Madrid, I think. That's wasn't right, it? yeah. yeah. It, it, it's amazing, really, because I know it, it affected Cyril, Cyril Regis, greatly, because they were big mates. And I think it was only um, a f- couple of weeks before, or about a month before, Cyril had been across to Madrid and he'd stayed with Laurie and they'd actually travelled on that road with Laurie driving. And I think that, you know, he knew exactly where that bend was you know the where the, where the accident happened but um it was it was a it was terrible really i mean he, he was coming to probably towards the end of his career anyway but um you you never forgot i mean i think you come in here today in the car and stuck at a traffic light work works traffic light and um you know you're thinking about it and, and thinking about lorry and the one thing about lorry he he never ran on the pitch he floated. Mm. It was always like a float. He he, he was so graceful, um, and he was he was. I think it was because he was so good on the on the dance floor. Mm. You know, with the, he got twinkling feet on the dance floor as well as on the football pitch. Um, he was a reserved type of lad. You know, he never really. I never really got to know him, as such. Um, I did you know a few interviews with him, and he was always brilliant, and he was very good. With the uh, Len Cantello testimonial match, and he he didn't see it as some people tried to make it out as white versus black. It was never that to him. That's what you should point out to younger listeners that that yeah. was a, a famous black team that's, versus a white team, wasn't that's it? That's right. Yeah, all 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 Laurie, um, Laurie was in was the captain, <clears throat> and they were all a, a, col- a different colour. You know, they were brown or they were black, um, and some people you know sort of tried to make out something that he wasn't. <clears throat> and <clears throat> oh, excuse me <clears throat> and it was Laurie actually said to me at the end of the game when we were in the uh, the reception <clears throat> I said how do you think it went Laurie and he said oh, very well I was very pleased and he said we ought to do this more often he said we ought to do this more often and I wrote the piece and I went into the style with, but it never did mm. and you think then of the integrations that could have happened yeah, um, 
I just remember the game, <coughs> and I know it was a bit of a struggle to put an all-black team out at that time, 1979. There weren't many um, black professional footballers around, so I mean, hence you had um, <coughs> Bernard Hodgson playing, who was just an Albion reserve. I mean, that's how difficult it was at the time, but of course we all saw a massive difference over the years that followed. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Lovey came to prominence with the Valencia game in 1978, yeah. didn't yeah. he? Were, were you at those yeah. games? Bob? Yeah. yeah, I was in Valencia. Uh, they were, they were, I mean, <laughs> I, it, it's difficult now because of you know the the you know restrictions you're under. But they they were chanting his name, but they weren't chant they weren't chanting Cunningham. Mm -hmm. It was uh, you know L, the mm -hmm. other word, and and they actually rose to Laurie when he came off the pitch. And you know everybody says, and it, it, it was true. That was the that was the night he sold himself to Real Madrid, mm. without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, he was he, he's superb, and a lot of people, a lot of the younger younger fans have probably heard about the the five three Manchester United. If ever you get the chance, look at it on YouTube. You can get it on YouTube. Just look at that. Look at some of the moves, and you think you know you could have been watching Brazil. Honestly, that's no word of a lie. Those some of those moves, they were absolutely brilliant. And the back heel from Cyril to Len Cantello, yeah. I still rate as one of the probably the best goal I've ever seen. Yeah, I always I wasn't there at the game unfortunately, but I always remember the commentary from Gerald Singstad. Oh, what a goal! Yeah, well, oh, what a goal! Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 perhaps didn't appreciate Laurie quite as much then as we we do now because he was a great player in a great team. Um, but it, it's it's great when you look back and you look at the conditions he played in on the muddy pitches. Uh, defenders who were allowed to kick you up in the air and not get booked, and he'd skip past them. As, you, as Bob yeah. said, he floated. I mean, how good would he have been now? Yeah. yeah. What, would he, what would he be worth yeah. in today's money? Well, Albion sold him for uh, near near a million, wasn't it? Yeah. Near near enough a million. Yeah. I mean, you can multiply that by thirty now. Yeah. Even yeah. fifty. Yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd be unplayable now, wouldn't he? Because nobody'd be able to kick him up in the air yeah. like they did yeah. then. He'd, he'd just be unstoppable. Um, Probably wouldn't be with the Albion, obviously, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, when he came to the Albion, he was presumably he was still a bit of an unknown, a bit of a gamble because he came from Leighton Orient, mm -hmm. didn't he? Well, there was Ronnie Allen who uh, who got him originally, um, and I'm not sure whether Leighton Orient really wanted. I think they were in, in a, probably a financial position where they had to sell him, and the, you know, the, he was one of the players who you know people were looking at. A lot of London clubs were looking at him, but didn't make a move for him. Um, Ronnie, I know, was serious, seriously impressed with him when he saw him for the first time, and he was determined to get him. And if you know, thankfully he did, because I mean, we didn't have met long with Laurie, but what what he brought to that team was absolutely incredible. Yeah, he, um, very few black players playing professional football at the time, and I think a lot of clubs were a bit reluctant to sign them. You know, it's mm -hmm. just. Completely um, different how it is today, but I remember him playing against the Albion for Orient during our promotion season, seventy five, seventy six, and um, I can't remember who was fullback. It might be Paddy Mulligan was fullback that day, and you know, um, Paddy Mulligan wasn't the quickest of players, but he had great positional sense. But um, Laurie stood out that day as well. I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic memories out of Laurie Cunningham. Now, sixty years ago. This month, Albert McPherson was appointed as the Albion coach, and you've got some good fond memories of him, haven't you, Bob? I have because at that time I, I, I was working for the Midland Chronicle when I first got to know Albert, and I used to cover the second and third team. Remember them, the reserve teams and the the A teams. They don't have them now, <laughs> and uh, you know, and it's it's still to me the biggest crying shame in football that there are no central league sides and there's no middle and intermediate sides because this is where they learnt their trade. And they don't get that now. You get a, you go into the academy, you play for the academy team, under 21, whatever. And I'll tell you, it's hell of a gap from mm -hmm. an under 21 academy team into even, even into a championship or a division one side because the game is totally different. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the kids today get that experience. You know, they, they, they put them on the bench for one game, like a cup tie, and you never see them again. You know, you, you give them that experience, 
Or they farm them out somewhere Or they else, farm them they? out. Yeah, they farm them out on loan. Yeah. And hoping that, that that's... Basically, the teams like, you know, Division One teams, Division Two teams, they can't afford them. They can't afford to have a, like a, a reserve team now because of the, the wages and, and the way mm. football's gone. But the Premier Division and the Championship, how many kids from their academies go out on loan? There's more players out on loan than have actually signed for the clubs. Mm. And that's that's the only way they can do it now. But Albert was such a such a perfectionist. And the one thing about Albert, as they said, you know, many times, if you put him in a pair of handcuffs, he'd be speechless. Mm -hmm. He taught, you know, he, he he was always, you know, using his hands to explain things where you where the lads have got a mark, even you know, when in the in the A team, the third team or at the Central League, but particularly in the A team. And remember in that A team, he'd got some cracking players. He'd got Acer Hartford, he got Len Cantello, he had didn't Lyndon I don't think Lyndon Hughes cut yeah, Lyndon Hughes would have been there. Jim Holton. All those players that were nurtured in that A team under Albert went into the Central League and then went into to get really good careers in in, in professional football. And that's that's what you, they miss now, mm. to me. They don't get that. It's all. It's all very well going out on loan to to Bolton. No, no disrespect to Bolton or or anybody like that. It's all right going on loan, but they are playing under a different, completely probably different situation and a different formation. They're going to have when they come back to their parent club, mm. and all the all the habits they've learned, probably not so good habits, when they've been on loan. You've got to get that out of them again when they come back to the parent club. Mm. It always it always gets to me when you go, so and so, so and so have just signed the fourteen year old Brazilian player, yeah. but he won't be coming until he's eighteen, <laughs> just to yeah. stop everybody else having yeah, him. That's any. right, yeah. yeah. Just ludicrous. Yeah. ludicrous. I tell you something, Chelsea, um, Arsenal, all the top six, they could put a team in Division Two, mm. and I tell you something, they'd probably win it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd have to play them, wouldn't they? The players instead yeah. of pocketing the money for yeah. sitting. <laughs> doing yeah. note <laughs> yeah yeah. I, I, I used to watch a lot of Central League football when I was younger uh, when it was a proper reserve league and yeah you'd see the promising youngsters coming through uh, I just didn't remember Derek Statham coming through and he looked outstanding mm. in the reserves yeah. from the start and within months he was in the first team and stayed there um, but you'd also get the, the first team squad players playing, playing inside yeah. the promising youngsters they, they'd be helping each other out you know the First team players will be getting regular competitive match practice, which they don't do now. They they no. sit on the bench for weeks, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they might come on yeah. for ten minutes. Um, as you say, the youngsters are playing alongside the experienced players mm. and learning the game properly. That's right, as Bob, yeah. Bob said earlier, uh, you don't you just don't get that anymore. It's a, it's a real novelty now to see youngsters coming through and making it into the first team. I mean, we had obviously got Alex Palmer now. Mm. Tom Fellows finally yeah. made the breakthrough, yeah. but you wonder whether any of the others will ever establish themselves in the Albion first team it's going to be interesting to see what you know people like Jack Ashworth who's coming back mm -hmm. yeah, I mean he spent a little time on Bol at Bolton on loan we've had quite a few players out on loan they that obviously couldn't be coming back um, it all depends now if, if they've really shone they're going to be staying if they're not they're going out on loan again mm. and it, it, it can't be good for them to keep going out on loan because you never really get settled. Mm. You know, you, at least if you've got a, a reserve team, that all together, that, that, that together all the that, all the week, and they're talking to each other and they're conversing with each other, and you know the elder players can help the young kids. Then, if they're out at Akron and Stanley, they ain't going to be getting mm. there. No, no, no. Yeah, there you go. Right, mo moving on. Fifty years ago now. Oh, so we're getting a bit closer uh, now. So uh, with all our memories at even now, July 1974, a very famous Albion player left the Albion. Mm. July 74 went to Dunstable. Yeah, there, and he's still known as the King. Yeah, the good old Jeff Astor. Yeah. Yeah. And went to Dunstable, who we were managed at the time by Barry Fry, wasn't he? That's it's right. Oh, no blimey! <laughs> yeah. I think I, I can't remember the name of the uh, Dunstable chairman, but he was throwing money at Barry Fry because I think he wanted to get into the Division One in about five seasons, something stupid like that. And he signed George Best, 
And Steve w- w- was talking to Steve. And I'll let you tell him, Steve. Yeah, there was. A, I remember obviously a lot of media coverage of George Best signing for Dunstable, and they showed a very brief clip of action of um, a game at Dunstable. Uh, they showed the game kicking off. Uh, they'd never mentioned once the bloke who did the kick off, which was Jeff Astle, because George Best was playing. Mm. Astle didn't even get a mention. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, even now, I mean, it's remarkable, and you know, the sort of the fellow's been dead a few years as well, as well now. And you, you mentioned and even to even some of the young fa- younger fans. You know, you mention Astle, and mm. they'll know who it is. Yeah, yeah. But my generation, and the, probably the generation after me, he'll always be the king. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's still he's still in sort of consciousness of of youngsters these days because the the Albion Foundation and the Astle Foundation mm. and all the work that uh, Dawn and Levine do is. The the work that, that they do, the work that Dawn has done in her dad's name has been exceptional. You can't you can't put anything you can't put a high point on what she's achieved, despite all the barriers that have been put in front of her from people supposedly with the football with football at the heart. Well professional footballers professional association foot, yeah. at one stage with Gordon Taylor, the memorable yeah. disputes with Dawn on that, which yeah. she's, she's managed to overcome. She overcome, and, and don't forget, she's overcome Parliament as well. Yeah. And she's got, you know, a lot of MPs on her side. She's certainly got all the Albion fans on her side. Yeah. In, in everything. I have got the utmost respect and regard for Dawn and for Lorraine because Lorraine helps her as well. And it's, it's great to see what they're doing because even now you see footballers from that generation are in care mm. and they're getting very little help. Yeah. He said, "It's a crying shame. It's a shame on football. It's just a shame on the professional game that, with the the amount of millions now flowing in to the Premiership, that they can't get a fund uh, set up whereby the families of profession, ex-professional footballers who have got their disease, they got their dementia, simply because they were giving people enjoyment. Mm-hmm. That they." You know, they're, they're, it always seems as though they're reluctant to help. Mm. You know, they'll pay somebody three hundred and fifty thousand pounds a week, and put him on the bench for about six weeks. What would well, th- I suppose then? Even even players, if they got a conscious about him, and you're on three hundred and fifty thousand pounds, you ain't gonna lose. You know, you ain't gonna miss fifty grand every no, now and then to no. put into a fund, are you? No, no. So no. yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he, what what would he do? Buy your insurance on your Lamborghini? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I don't know about Lamborghini. I'm not into all this foreign food stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jeff, of course, was a great servant to the Albion. One of the 170 odd goals, 360 games, something mm. like that that he played. And of course, his most memorable game, of course, was obviously was Wembley. And ev- everybody says, "Oh, and every time you talk about 68, of course, it's Astor and the goal." But it's it's something you can't change. The memory's there, and it's never going to go away. That is it. No. And I know Lorraine uh, Dawn, uh, Je- Jeff's uh, widow, has always got fond memories, and she still loves talking about it. And she's so sincere when she's talking about it. And I, I sat down with her a, a month or so back, and uh, spoke to her at length about Jeff and that day at Wembley. And this is what she had to say. Yes, I remember it like it was yesterday. I can remember absolutely everything about it. Um, I remember they left on the Tuesday to go to Southport, as they always did. And I remember saying to Jeff as he got in the car, you know, all the best for Saturday, although I knew we'd be talking on the phone before then. And I hope you win. And I remember his words to me where we'll do our best. And then we spoke on the phone, but it didn't seem obviously until after Wembley. And, and uh, I remember, I remember every bit of the day, the wives we went got went to the to the ground. We went on the coach to the station, went on the train. A coach met us, took us to the hotel, Park Lane Hotel. And I remember we had we had lunch there, all of us, and. Um, it, I was nervous. I was very nervous. Um, I, I did often wonder about Jeff because um, 
all the fans were sort of relying on him to score. And I just remember thinking, I felt the tension of that. And I wasn't even going to be there. Um, I wasn't, you know, part of that. Um, and I just remember th th thinking how Jeff must have felt with that weight on his shoulders um, because he'd scored in every round and everyone was expecting him. And I knew that Everton would have, you know, him heavily marked. And they did. And I was fortunate enough a few years ago to talk to John Hurst. And um, he said that day there was Brian LeBone and himself marking Jeff because of his, you know, of his scoring. And he said, but like all good strikers, that one opportunity came, he shook them off and he scored. Um, but the day itself, I've often said I wished I could have gone back, now I knew the score and done it all again. Because if you said to me, did I enjoy it? I didn't because I was so nervous. I, I so wanted us to win. And I was just so nervous. And it's only when that final whistle went. Jeff said when he scored, he could have jumped over the stand. I could have jumped over the stand when that final whistle. I've never wanted a referee to blow a whistle. Before or since. And I just remember, I remember when he scored, he'd had a shot seconds before, and Alan James, Clive James's son, the director, him and his sister Rosie, they sat just in front of me, and he jumped up thinking that was going to go in. And it rebounded straight away off Ray Wilson, uh, Everton player, and back to Jeff, and of course did it with his left foot. And Alan hadn't quite sat down, and I knew we'd scored because everybody had this woman, everybody jumped up. And I, on getting up, said, oh, scored. And Alan turned around, he said, you're just scored. But of course, I couldn't see. Oh. And, he, and I remember him turning around, he grabbed hold of me and he lifted me literally off my feet. And we just stood, we were hugging, we were laughing, we were crying. And then I thought, oh God, we've got all that time left you know two minutes into extra time we've got all that time left and um and I, I did feel that the Albion were the fitter in extra time I really did feel that I mean they were very heavy legs because it had rained heavily in the morning and I remember the sun shone and when Dennis Clark the substitute came on the sun sort of came out and um and I remember Dennis's wife uh, who'd been enjoying the game and then when Dennis came on she got really really nervous and she disappeared to the toilets for God that was how long bless her yeah, that's, for, for younger people who don't know Dennis was Dennis Clark wasn't he yeah. so he was their first ever substitute, first substitute in the cup final it was the first cup final in colour because we'd played in all white white socks and then the BBC said look because it was in colour we were playing all in white didn't make any difference so they said could the Albion wear a colour so they had red socks I don't think they were overly happy about it the players because they're you know a bit superstitious yeah. but they wore red socks and I've still got them you know and the players keep the shirt right. well I've got the shirt the shorts and the red socks right. and I'm the only one that's got those that got the socks as well and um, it was a most fantastic day Jeff always, Jeff always said, you know, he was very proud when he was picked for his country, but his proudest moment was the Albion winning the cup. So, Nothing uh, would ever take that away from him. How soon did you see him then after the final whistle? I didn't see him until we, we the wives went back. Um, there's a story about that. I was walking back with um, Irene Brown, Tony Brown's wife, with somehow or another lost everybody else and we found ourselves walking at the back of Wembley <clears throat> still in in the actual stand turned the corner and found Everton fans coming towards us in the thousands we had no idea where we were we had no idea where the car park was and there was no one no other wives they, they'd all obviously we'd obviously gone in the wrong direction we found ourselves up against a wall and I was really frightened because we were right against this wall. And I said to Irene, 
take your rosette off, put it in the sandbags. And we just managed to literally shove it in the handbag. And I remember the top of my rosette was showing at the top. <laughs> I said, we're going to get squashed against this wall. And I had visions of the, everybody on the coach waiting for us. And I thought, oh, I'm going to, we're going to, oh, they're not going to be very happy with us. Looking back, somebody did say, Lorraine, your husband had just scored a goal. They, they wouldn't have mind if you'd have held the, car, the bus up, but I didn't see it like that. And I said, hang, hang on to my, jack, my coat at the back, Irene. I said, and don't talk, because obviously Irene is, you know, came from Wensbury and, and, and they knew if she spoke, she was a, a West Brom fan. Yeah. So I said, just hang on, don't say anything. And, and, and she gripped my coat. I can feel a grip in the back of my coat. I said, don't say a word. So I pushed up my Nottingham accent. <laughs> and I said, oh, talk. and we were in the middle of them then. And I said, excuse me. I said, we're Everton players' wives. And we, we've got to find the coach and we, we don't know where it is. We have no idea. We, we don't know. We've no idea where we are. And... Um, and these fans, they said, lads, lads. And they were turning around, our lads' wives here. <laughs> Make us, and, and it, like the Red Sea parted. The Everton fans parted for us, either side. And they all passed on, it's our players' wives here. And all I could hear Irene going was, oh, <laughs> oh. You know, every time I said it, tell the, and one said to me, tell the lads not to worry. They did the best. Don't worry. I said, Thank you so much. I will tell them. And I will tell them. And, and, and every time I said this anything... This is fantastic. I've never heard this story I had before. to answer them. And all I could hear was Irene at the back of me, gripping my car, going, oh. So I said, oh, come on, let's get through. And they actually parted for us. Give the lads our best. I said, yes, I will do. Thank you. I will tell them. And we got through. And Irene and I, we stood when we got through and we just looked at each other. And we didn't know whether to laugh, cry. We were both shaking. And I said, oh, come on, we've got, we've got to find the coach. And we did find it. We went actually all that far away. And we got on the coach. And actually, there were others that were still finding the way back. We weren't even late. But that's perfectly true. I never mentioned it at all to Jeff when we got back. But Irene had told Tony. So when we went down to the reception, Tony said, what about these two and the Everton fans? Jeff didn't know. And Jeff said, I don't know what you mean. So Tony told him what had happened. Jeff played out with me. <laughs> he said, Lorraine. He said, Fancy telling you were the Everton. I said, Well, I couldn't say we were the West Bromwich players' <laughs> wives. He said, No, but they'd lost. I said, No, hang on. The wives hadn't lost. The players had lost. The wives hadn't kicked a ball. Why should they turn on Irene and I? To all intents and purposes, we'd be just as gutted as they were. Yeah. I said, no, never entered my head that they would do that. And they didn't. And he said, but fancy saying that. He said, they, they could have been. I said, well, they weren't. So we look at it like that. We got out, we were unscathed. And I said, I'm just wondering what they're going to think of when our photographs are in the paper. <laughs> and they said, that's that one that said she was an Everton player. <laughs> What about, what about the reception then? I bet it was a good do, wasn't it? Oh, it was brilliant. I remember I was in, just walking out the bathroom. I'd got, had a shower and got changed when Jeff came in. Um, and I, I see him now, walking in with his West Brom suit and his tie. And he put his Adidas bag down. And I came, walked out the bed, bathroom and as he walked through the door into the bedroom, and it was a massive bedroom. And I just see he just stopped to put his bag down. He walked about two strides towards me. I walked across to him. He just held his arms out. We never said a word. We just stood and we hugged. We never spoke a word. I never said, oh, you scored, you scored, and you did it, Jeff. Not one word. We didn't need to. I knew he'd done what he wanted and I knew the lads had played the hearts out and Alan was such a wonderful manager he was real one he really was one of the lads I have the greatest of affection for him and his wife and I just we just hugged there was no need for words 
He just unhooked. And it's as clear to me now as it was then, and it's, I'm sorry, but it still affects me now. The happiness. No one thought we'd win. Everton were odds on favourites. Everton didn't think that uh, they'd lose. That was blatantly obvious. Um, and we did. The underdog. We, we played together as a team. We fought for each other. You know, we attacked, we all attacked, defended, we all defended. And they wanted to win it, they wanted to win it for the fans, for Alan, for, for everybody. And uh, it, it was marvellous. We had Bob Munkhouse, who was a comedian that night, and I said it must have been the easiest money he ever made because he didn't need to tell jokes to make us laugh. You know, we were walking on the ceiling and virtually yeah. it was absolute and then of course Jeff was presented with the Midland Footballer of the Year and uh, it was marvellous the, the happiest time I, th I think Jeff and I and, and the lads of that team and Alan I think that moment was one of the happiest times in our life and nothing, nothing has come close to it since Nothing. Even when Jeff played for England, I was in, sat in the Royal Box and I was immensely proud. I can honestly say, like my Jeff, that weekend and then going on the coach and all those fans, from the minute we walked out the station and got on the coach and the players sat on the roof and Alan and they're all there sitting on the roof with the cup, Oh, it was something that you only dream about. And I remember before Wembley, someone did say to Jeff, if you won the cup, Jeff, what are you most looking forward to? And he said, sitting on the roof of the coach, showing the fans what we've won, lifting the cup and showing them we've done this, we've won it for you. And he got his wish. Black Country Extra with the Throssel Club with myself, Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing. The Throssel Club on Black Country Extra and also on Black Country Radio at various times. You can also find it on my website, tntnews.co.uk, tntnews.co.uk. And it's also available on all good podcast providers, including the likes of Spotify. Now, just finishing off on things from many years ago, 30 years ago, Bob, back in July 1994, one of our local lads, Wayne Faraday, left and went off to Cardiff. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, didn't really, I, I didn't really see Wayne playing. Um, what, what year did you say it was? So it was 94 when he, he moved on. 94, yeah, yeah well, I was, I was then on with the GGs. So, um, but I mean, obviously, I mean, you used to talk at... I used to talk to all the, the lads who were covering the football and I still went to a few games myself but you know I mean um, he, he, he was signed by Bobby Gould wasn't he and yeah. that was that traumatic 91-92 <laughs> season which you know probably yeah. not the best time not in the, the world to go to the Albion the no. Wayne had always got his heart in the Albion though he didn't really want to leave the Albion he, he even offered to take a pay cut mm. under Keith Birkinshaw to stay at the Albion but uh, Birkinshaw wouldn't have it and I spoke to Wayne about this and He's not bitter about it, but I think he's he's very, just very sad that uh, his time at the Albion uh, came about because he had a few injuries and uh, that didn't suit Birkinshaw. And uh, consequently, he decided he wanted to get rid of him. This is what uh, Wayne had to say about it. Keith pulled me in and he, and he more or less said, uh, uh, not you know good to us, but in a way he was saying, look, you're always injured. Ozzy wanted you playing. But you're always, always injured. Da, 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 da. This is going to carry on. I can't deal with that. So you're out of contract. We're just letting you go. Um, and I actually said to him, "Look, to stay at this club, I will do whatever. Even if you offer me new contract, I will take a pay cut." And obviously, I wasn't on a lot of money at all. Not a lot of money at all. And I offered to take a pay cut to stay. Um, and I think there was. I think there was something in the paper that a lot of the fans was trying to get me to stay, mm -hmm. but he just wasn't having any of it. Um, you know, as, as as good a manager he was, and as you know, you can't. His career he had was great. Uh, a lot of a lot of the lads, he was he was not the most cheerfulest <laughs> cheerfulest guy. Uh, so you couldn't really talk to him anyway. And he was one of them. Once he'd made his decision, 
that was it. That was it. But yeah, the, the, that's the truth. I, uh, I was gutted, absolutely gutted, because I know I'd had all the injuries. I know that. I know that. Uh, but I wasn't on great money, at all. Uh, and when he said you're leaving, yeah, I, I was in tears. I must admit, I was gutted, and and I did offer. I, I offered everything. I said, look, I'll take a pay cut, just to stay, just to have another. However, try and let me get fit, try and let me get properly fit again so I can prove to you that I can do what you want me to do. Um, but it was, like you say, once he made his mind up, that was that was it, that was the end of that. So uh, begrudgingly, begrudgingly, it was hard to, to just pack my stuff and leave. So that's quite sad there with uh, Wayne Faraday talking about leaving the Albion. You've got some fun memories of him, haven't you, Steve? Yeah, just a couple of things. I um, remember him signing midway through the 91-92 season. Um, one of the few good things Bobby Gould did do for the Albion, other than signing Bob Taylor, but um, Faraday was probably our most consistent player during the second half of that season. Um, playing at full-back, he'd go on... He'd, go, he'd just carry the ball forward for us. He was... Very, uh, he was a genuinely two footed player. Um, he carried the ball huge distances, lay it off. He, he was just a really good player to watch. Um, strangely, he didn't feature much the following season under Ozzy Ardiles. But then the other most memorable thing I remember about Wayne was the, f the following season when Ardiles had gone and Birkenshaw was in charge. Was it was um, Faraday who helped set up that. Memorable goal for Darren Bradley against Wolves oh, yes. at the Hawthorns. Yeah. Again, Faraday yeah. carrying the ball from deep in his own yeah. half, uh, knocking the ball through. I think it was to Andy Hunt who laid it off, and Darren Bradley, one of his extra sets into the top corner. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Wayne's actually spoken about that on one of our earlier programmes, yeah, which yeah. was uh, obviously a, a fantastic memory for Wayne and a brilliant memory for lots of Albion fans as well. Now, talking about Wayne. Oh, not not one of these funny name things now, is it? Well, funny you should mention that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Wayne, been thinking of rain, which is appropriate for the weather we've been having, isn't it? I wonder oh. if we could have a wet and windy Albion 11. Oh, <laughs> God, here we go. So who would we have? Uh, windy as in what? In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the weather, in the weather, of course. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. So we'd have the bat. So obviously we'd, you'd certainly have rain Faraday would be in it. Oh. A manager with a... Sort of rainy cloud would be a sort of serious, serious or civil Regis type thing. Could be the manager, couldn't it? We could have Dwight Gale. Yeah. We could easily have Dwight. What about Peter? Easter. Odom. Odom Wingy. Odom Windy. Peter Odom Windy. Could have one of the blasts from the past would have been Mr. Jeffcott. Oh, Claude. Cloud. Cloud, Cloud yeah. Jeffcott. Yeah. I ain't got into this really, have I, Bill? No. Right. Uh, what about uh, Carnu? Come on, Steve. Carnu. Rob Robson Carnu uh, was. Oh, oh, how? Hail, 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 hail. Robson Carnu. I was thinking of the other Carnu. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> the one in which the open goal. Yeah, this is going well. <laughs> uh, what about the youngster Harper? Rookie. Rain, Rain, Rain Keem Rain. Harper. Yeah, do, Very right. good. And then we could have Burn. Hard. Bernard McNally could be Reynard McNally, couldn't he? Jesus. And then I'll, go, I'll get that one. <laughs> a, a, a good good defender is Ken. Ken but no. Fog. Go. Ken Fogo. Fogo. Ken Fogo. Ken Fogo. Uh, and what, he spends hours doing these, you know, and they just fall well, flat. What, what about one of the uh, the famous Browns? Alec. Tony Brown, but Tornado yes. Ali Brown. Yeah. We could have and Tornado me, Ali Brown. Brown and my favourite. Remember, Mr. Reed from the sixties. Huey. Huey. Huey Midity Huey. Reed. Huey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's, a, it's amused me for that hour. Yeah. Stuff, anyway. Yeah, I'm glad it's amused you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Should we move it's, on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Just, the people who were uh, during that segment have made the cup of tea. Yeah, that's back it. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Right, now in front of me, I've got this brilliant new book, big long title. Here we go. It says, A History of West Bromwich Strollers and West Bromwich Albion, 1878 to 1888, from Dartmouth Park to the Football League, by
by Steve Carr, Robert Bradley, Colin McKenzie, Barry Marsh and Kevin Powell. So there's more words in that title on the front than there is in some books that I've read. But, but uh, it's a brilliant book and it's one of these that it says does everything that it says it does. Fantastic, well-researched history on the first 10 years of the Albion. And Steve, you must be really chuffed with this. Yeah, chuffed, uh, re relieved that it's finally made it into print. Uh, it, it's taken a few months. There's uh, far more to getting this stuff into print than you could ever possibly imagine. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, finally published last week. And uh, yeah, great to see it in print. It's um, as I hoped it would be. Yeah. So go on, tell us about the contents then. Contents, right. Um, well, the first 10 years of the Albion's history um, has never been covered in any sort of depth before. I mean, there are there have been various histories of the club over the years. They mention the club's origins. They mention us winning the, reaching the cup final three years running and winning it, becoming founder members of the Football League. But um, very little detail about all the other games the Albion played. Um, and our research shows Albion, during those first 10 years, played around 360 games. And most people will only be aware of you know, the cup finals or you know, the odd other game that's mentioned, you know, the 26-0 the win against Coesley, the... 26 new deal. Ah, Cosley. Ah, Cosley. I think it was. Um, I think it was Bob Downing's report. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. 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 No. <laughs> no. Come on. I would never. I would never say anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else jumped on the bottle and bandwagon. In fact, I'm slightly annoyed that you got there before I did. But there you go. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, I mean, the books um, in sort of three. Um, Three distinct parts. There's a, a narrative um, describing it season by season, how the club developed, players that came and went, uh, the various different grounds the Albion played on during that period. Um, the, the longest part of it actually is, is a who's who. We, um, we've identified uh, 93 players who made at least one first team appearance during that period, and we've done um, full biographies as far as we can for all of them, you know. Date of birth, date of death, um, census stuff in there. We've tried to do um, uh, a career history, all the clubs they played for, um, how long they were with the Albion, you know, their, their first and last appearances, um, honours won while they were with the Albion, um, perhaps some personal achievements. Uh, and then some uh, statistics. We, uh, we've tried to collate appearances and goals um, for each of those 93 players. Um, and then at the end, we've got the um, results grids. We've, um, again, for all those, well, for most of those 360 games, we've uh, identified the team lineups. We've got goal scorers for a lot of them. We've identified the day and date of the game, the venue where it was played, attendances where given. Uh, and all this information has, has never appeared in print before anywhere ever. Um, as I say, other previous histories have just not gone into this in any any sort of detail so, at all. So the big begs the question: How did you find out mm. all this information? Then how did you go about it? What how did you research? Yeah, well, as, as you've probably already guessed, we're we're a group of anoraks. It's it's what we enjoy doing. But we yeah, um, a lot of it sitting in libraries, playing through the old newspaper records of the time. Um, meticulously handwritten notes of anything we find. Um, I mean, certainly new newspapers these days um, are dying out. Is that fair to say, yes. Bob? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but b back in the day, the you know we didn't have television, we didn't have radio, and the newspapers were the only means of getting news, unless it was word of mouth. Um, so, you know, so a lot of towns would have more than one newspaper. I mean, West Bromwich had two newspapers. Um, a lot of this, the towns around us had at least one and sometimes two or three newspapers. So, I suppose the, the point as well is that in those days, the newspapers were detailed, weren't they? So they went yes. into everything in minute detail. Yeah, I mean, cer certainly in the 1870s, football wasn't as well covered um, I mean, because it, it started off as a bit of a pastime. Uh, a lot of it was because um, cricket was more well established and I think a lot of cricketers certainly started playing football during the winter months to um, sort of stay in contact with their mates. Um, games weren't always reported in the press at the time but quickly 
it became apparent that football was becoming popular and was attracting crowds, maybe hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. Um, I think newspaper editors became aware. They send a report to do a report of the game, uh, and, and gradually football coverage um, started to appear in the newspapers. Um, so yeah, you do get sometimes just brief reports. You might just get the score. Um, but then as time progresses, you get to the 1880s, you start to get the lineups given. Um, sometimes the goal scorers are named. They start giving you an idea of the attendance, which, again, was only an estimate. There were no mm. uh, official attendances given then. And then you've got cup competitions being introduced. And, and the game just takes off. Did you did you sort of section it off between the five of you? Yeah, what, 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 what we've done, I mean, we've, I wouldn't like to say how long... We've been working on this sort of stuff uh, more years than we care to remember, but it's it's a labour of love. But yeah, um, how this has worked in more recent times is um, you've got the British newspaper archive, which is uh, digital. So uh, we've got Barry Marsh, uh, one of my co-authors. He spends hours going through a particular newspaper, and you can do, with using the modern search engines, you can identify anything that says mm. Albion or whatever. Yeah. He, he, he copies the reports, he puts them onto a massive um, Word document. He'll often identify reports of the same game from different sources. Um, so he'll, he'll copy and paste all of that. And then uh, Colin McKenzie is the one who then does a summary. He'll do a match summary of date, score line, um, line if we've got it, goal scorers if we've got them. Um, attendance, if that's given, the venue. Um, from that, um, I started putting the Excel spreadsheets together, putting it all into chart form. Um, Robert Bradley is our genealogist. He spends hours going through um, various ancestry websites, the general uh, register office records, identifying dates of birth and mm. death and so on and identifying where these players came from um, it, it just just developed informally to start with but um, but yeah that, 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 that's how it's happened it's just hours and hours of something that fascinates us and perhaps it's quite boring to most other people but it fascinates us and <laughs> No, you, you're doing yeah. yourself down there a bit. So it is, yeah. it yeah. is crammed with statistics and facts and figures, but you've also got some nice quirky bits about individual players and stuff. Yeah. Aren't yeah. They? So tell us a, briefly about one of two of the characters from that time. Oh, blimey, you put me on the spot now, yeah. Um, some of the individual players. Um, there was some of the Perrys was a yeah. well-known well family, weren't they? Yeah, we've got, got the Perry family. I mean, there was several of them. Uh, obviously, Charlie Perry, who um, captained um, the cup team in 1988. Um, a couple of his brothers, all um, brothers also uh, played for the Albion. You've got Billy Bassett in there, who um, used to go to the school next door to the uh, the Four Acres Ground that Albion used for three years. Um, You've got one or two unsavoury characters in there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there you see, I, I told you we've got some good stories. Uh, I mean, you've got a guy called um, Job White, who only made a handful of appearances for the album, but was um, often in trouble with the law uh, oh, for oh, illegal right. street betting, amongst other things. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, who else have we got in there? Um, yeah, Norm's just put me on the spot. I'm okay. just, I'm just scratching my head I'll, a bit. I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more later in the yeah, program yeah, yeah. if we get the time, because uh, time's w really whizzing through today, and we haven't had our quiz yet. Oh. And we can't <coughs> go without the quiz of the week. <coughs> yeah. Are you right. ready for this? Yeah. Pen ready. Steve versus Bobby in the, the quiz of the week oh. in the remaining time that we've got. So... It's not from Norwich, oh, but it's from we've home. got we the, the knowledge. knowledge. <laughs> it's the quiz of the week. <coughs> right, show out, show out your answers then. Okay. So in July 1993, who succeeded Ozzy Ardiles as manager? Birkinshaw. 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 Yeah. Point to Steve. <clears throat> in July 1920, which child born in London was to grow up, grow up to become a cup-winning goalkeeper? Pearson. Sanders. No. Sanders. Yes. Sanders. Ooh, two hey. already. Hey, sure in the way here. Sure. Right. <coughs> uh, number three, in July 1959, V 
Vic Buckingham was replaced as manager by Gordon oh, Clark. Gordon Clark. Hey, Oof, three I'll go nil. home now. <laughs> three now. Can you well, declare, Steve? <laughs> you can play your joker in a minute, Bob. <laughs> right, number four. In July 1999, the Albion started pre-season at which Danish side? Grieve. Grieve, yeah. yes. I wouldn't have known that. I wouldn't have known that. You were there, but I was there for that one, yeah. yeah. Right, number five. One with four down. Right, after the sacking of Alan Ashman, who became Albion manager? Don Hale. Ooh, Steve again. Ooh. Oh, right. He's been revising, hasn't he? Yeah. Hey, after the last time, how he's many, been revising. We've got already. Basically. We're five, five up. Yeah. Right, five marks on this one. <laughs> on this one. Number six, which crew striker joined the Albion? Rob Hulse. Rob Hulse. Oh, it's 10 nil. Did you get that? Nah. All oh, right. Oh, dear. Two questions to go. So Ooh. there's 10 marks on this one. <laughs> Right, in July 1981, Ronnie Allen became the new manager at the Albion, replacing Ron Atkinson, 20 nil. Did you say Ron Atkinson? No, I did, but it, oh, oh, sorry, Steve, your mic was down, I didn't hear that. Oh, you got 10 points. So, it's ten, so it all rests on this one then, doesn't it? Yeah, this it? is a tie break. It all rests on this one, tie break. Right, this is it. In July 1972, Albion beat Wrexham. In which preseason? What, what Nico? Oh, oh hey, this has been a whitewash, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a well whitewash. Done. Well done. So, after you scored a maximum of 10 in the previous <laughs> quiz, I think, didn't you? Yeah. Absolute whitewash huh? this time. Got beat by any ninja. Even, <laughs> even Billy, with his scorekeeping, couldn't say Now I couldn't fiddle it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, I've got to get my books out again. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there we are then. So it's the Throstle Club that you're listening to on Black Country Radio. This is the Throstle Club with Norman Bartlam and Bob Downing. Well, Bob's sitting in the corner now, sulking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sulking he is, isn't he? Yeah. Have you ever seen him sulk like this? Bill? No, no. He's got a mizzle on there. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Ruin my week, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got no grounds for, to complain. Uh, no, 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 I can't. No, I bow down to superior knowledge from Steve, I do. And talking of grounds, yeah. moving yeah. Like oh, swift, yeah. swiftly on. Steve, you're the font of all knowledge when it comes to Albion's early years, of course. And you've been looking into some of the Albion's early grounds, haven't you? So we're going back to Stony Lane and places, places like that that people will have heard of. Yeah, we've um, done features on each of the grounds Albion played during those early years. Um, we've looked at um, into Cooper's Hill, which is sort of part of Albion folklore. Although what we've found is there are no reports of any games actually being played there. I don't know whether it was oh, right. somewhere where the strollers were used originally in um, at the time when there were no newspaper reports um, of the games being played. But Cooper's Hill is certainly referred to. Um, they moved to Dartmouth Park. That, that opened in um, 1878. Um, and by the following year, the Albion were playing there. They were, as you may, it's just a, just a public park, you know, it, it's a ground in the sense that Albion are playing games there, but there's no facilities there. Um, Albion are there with other clubs. Um, who got whoever gets there first gets the the best part <laughs> of the park to play on. You know, it's it's not yeah. even like when I was playing as a youngster at, Dar at um, King George playing fields behind mm. the park, where you get allocated a pitch. In those days, you turned up with your equipment and you'd mark out a pitch wherever there was space for the clubs have got there first you had to go and find another spot you know um albion played at dartmouth park for a couple of years um but they, by then they were already starting to make a bit of a name from them for themselves they were sort of seeing off all the local opposition they were starting to spread the wings they'd meet clubs from some of the other neighboring towns um and they decided um to construct their own ground so they they found an area of land they were able to lease and, and you couldn't imagine modern players doing this at any level but they actually enclosed the ground themselves using mm -hmm. timber that they bought themselves they used their own labor to erect it um, so this this was a, 
um, Bunsfield, or, or the Birches as it became known. So Albion players actually, if you think about it, the average football pitch, you're looking at about 400 yards of fencing. And they put all that up themselves to enclose the ground. And uh, it meant they could um, charge admission to come in to watch their games. So wasn't that one of the first grounds in the country, I think, wasn't it, that we actually charged admission for? Very probably, yeah. I mean, I imagine at Dartmouth Park they would have had the idea of perhaps trying to take a collection, but you know, you're in a you're in a public park, and if people don't want to contribute, they won't. So by having your own ground, yeah, if it very probably was one of the first enclosed grounds of any sort. They they charge admission, and um, you know, the because Albion are building up a bit of a following, they are collecting money and it goes towards the uh, the upkeep of the club um i think they quickly outgrew the birches um and just a short distance away you've got the the four acres cricket ground where uh, west bromwich dartmouth were playing at the time that's an enclosed ground you know it's got a, a brick wall around it um and obviously the dartmouth prominent cricket club um but the dartmouth themselves have also been running their own football team for a while um, so yeah, they they um, when their football team folded, the Albion um, ended up playing there for three years and Good you know man. grew grew quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of other grounds. Stony Lane, of course, is the one that people mention most. One of the more recent grounds before they moved to the Albion. We'll talk about that in a, a future program, I think. But uh, that's about all we've got time for in this edition of the, the Thrustle Club. So thanks very much, Steve, for coming in for that. Yeah, no so the brilliant book, A History of West Bromwich Albion Strollers and West Bromwich Albion, 1878 <laughs> to 1888. It's it's available in all good bookshops now. And there's Black Sheep Bookshop in Wensbury, isn't it? Uh, is bl good Blue Sheep. Product? Blue Sheep Books Blue in Wensbury, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. also available um, on eBay. Uh, and also if you go on the Look Back in Albion Facebook page, my, um, my own details are on there. You can okay. contact me directly. So, I've gone from a blue sheep to a black sheep to a red face. I think I'm getting that one mixed up. So th thanks, Bob, for being with us. Thanks to you as well, Billy, for Pleasure. doing what it is you've been doing. And uh, <laughs> thanks you to you folks for listening in. Black Country, online, on your mobile.